Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael. I am a journalist with Tech in Asia. Uh, what we do is we try to connect Asia's different tech startup ecosystems by finding and telling interesting stories about them and bringing them together through events and networks. Um, as you can imagine, I spend a lot of time thinking about technology. It's something that I love. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about lately is this, is the future of work, how it affects the way that we work, and we're going to work in the future. So let me ask you something. So who here has used Wikipedia before to look up things? I will, right? I mean, of course. But it's not so long ago that encyclopedias were actually huge stacks of books that you had to pour over to find the information you wanted. It's not so long ago that we were using pens to write letters to people, to communicate, or for work. Things like, no, dear Esther, I hope you're well. It's been a month since my last letter. Yada, 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 don't forget the milk. No. But it doesn't happen so much anymore. Now we use computers. We use our phones. We go on Google to learn how to cook curry rice, for example. Or we would if this showed up. We did. Or, you know, to look up how old Ryan Gosling is. Which you can actually look up right now on your phones. And if you're fast enough, you can tell them. So we use our, we use our phones to get cars to our doors to drive us places. We use our phones to get people to do laundry for us, which I swear is a real thing. And we have food delivery. Yeah. Technology has always affected the way that we work, and it keeps on doing that. Um, those examples that I mentioned are part of what's called the sharing economy, which is people who are able to get jobs on demand on their phones from apps. It's people like Uber drivers. It's people like um, food delivery guys. It's Airbnb hosts. So the sharing economy is made possible by technological advancements in smartphones, in the way that we store data online, in the way that we access data. Um, so technology now brings us to a point that's very similar to something that actually happened 200 years ago, around, around there. It was called the Industrial Revolution, and what it was was the first time that people heard the word automation. Machines that could do the job that people used to do. So suddenly, people like weavers or iron workers or you know, horse cart drivers or whatever suddenly found out that their jobs could be done by machines much faster, much more efficiently, at a much larger, larger scale. Now, for these people, the coming of technology, the coming of automation, was something that pulled the rug out from under them. It was kind of the end of the world. They were not prepared for it. They had no idea it was coming. The factories, in fact, thought it was a good idea to put children to work so that they could teach them those jobs, those new jobs, and they could have workers for the future. So now, these days, we're living through another industrial revolution, and this one's called Industrial Revolution 4.0, because we're all digital now, you know. And this one has the potential to change our lives much more fundament fundamentally, because this one is driven by artificial intelligence, or AI. Now, AI is the ability of a computer to make decisions, to solve problems, based on incredible amounts of data without any human help. Now, this is a very simplistic definition, and it doesn't even begin to cover the potential of AI, nor what it can do. But samples, examples of AI exist everywhere around us. Siri on your iPhone is a kind of AI. It takes instructions from you, and it tries to understand them, and then it looks online to find the answers. There's not, there isn't a human on the other side just frantically Googling, you know, how old Ryan Gosling is. He's 37, by the way. I don't know if you guys know it. <laughs> Same as me. Hey, um, Amazon's Alexa. It, it's a form of AI that takes instructions, and it can turn your air conditioning on. It can play your favorite music. 
Google Photos on Android phones, it can recognize, for example, features and pictures like smiles. So if you search for smiles, it's going to show you those pictures. Now, as technology advances, the leaps it takes get bigger and more impactful and more important. Think about the 1960s when astronauts went to the moon. This was what they used to find their way. This was the computer on the Apollo spaceship, the Apollo guidance computer. Do you know how powerful this thing is? They say that the iPhone in your pocket is actually tens of thousands of times faster than this computer. And this thing went to the moon. So in the same way, this new industrial revolution is expected to affect a lot more people than it did last time. Because last time it affected people who work with their hands, people who work with tools, because machines were suddenly better tools. Now, it's going to affect people who work with their brains, because machines are becoming more powerful, more powerful brains. Now, who here has used Uber or Grab before? A lot of people. How would you feel if next time you booked a, a ride on your app, a car without a driver showed up? Now, Uber is actually testing this technology right now, driverless cars. Grab is doing the same thing here in Singapore, uh, working with a company called Newton. Now, if they succeed, you're not going to need these drivers anymore. The cars will just show up in driving places. I assume a lot of people um, buy stuff here from eBay or Amazon or Lazada or Taobao. Well, how would you feel if next time you bought a dress or a set of speakers, a drone showed up and just dropped it on your doorstep or your balcony? Amazon and UPS are actually testing this technology right now. Autonomous drones that can do deliveries. These drones will be able to find the fastest route to your house. They, they're going to know the best time to find you there. You're not going to need careers anymore. And that doesn't sound like such good news for the drivers and queries, does it? McKinsey, which is this uh, international consulting firm, did a study this year. And it found that 5% of all jobs worldwide can be done by machines, completely, with no humans required. Now, that doesn't sound so bad, because 5% of jobs, okay, it's not so many jobs. But it also found that 30% of activity on 60% of other jobs can be automated. And this means that not all jobs will be lost in machines, but a lot of jobs, most jobs, are going to require fewer people to do them. Think about law firms, for example. They employ paralegals, they employ young lawyers to go through hundreds and thousands of pages of contracts and documents, looking for mistakes, um, making sure that everything is okay. Software can now do this on its own much faster. And as it learns, as it gains experience, it can actually start to create these documents itself. So law firms are going to need fewer paralegals, fewer young lawyers to do this to complete jobs. The bank, J.P. Morgan, uses a software called Contract Intelligence, and it found that it can do in seconds what took its lawyers 360,000 hours. Now, this type of difference is insane. There's a company in the Netherlands called SemLab. They created an artificial intelligence called JuryBot, which looks very cute to me. But what this does is it can accurately predict the outcome of criminal cases. So JuryBot began as a sort of database for law students and young lawyers to look up data from past cases to, to find out um, who the parties were, who the lawyers were, what the facts were, um, what laws were applied, which sounds pretty helpful. But the company found out that with all this data, the, the bot could actually predict the judge's decision, which kind of makes the bot into a bit of a judge itself. And in the US, there are companies who are making AI that can do your taxes, which means buy, buy accounting jobs. And maybe you're thinking, all right, you know, these jobs, I thought they were safer, but maybe not. But I don't care because I want to be a writer. I want to be an artist. I want to be a musician. Well, think again because AI can actually 
do his jobs as well. Last year, the Associated Press experimented with AI to write sports articles. Now, the system was taking data from sports games, like you know how many points this player scored, or um, how long the overtime was, or whatever, and just crank out news articles. And you know, I don't know what that says about sports writing in general, but they were actually pretty good. Baidu in China, which is the Chinese Google, basically, they created an AI that can look at images and decide what what mood they have. Like, are they happy images? Or are they sad images? And based on that, it can compose original music. Do you know who this guy is? That's right, he's Elon Musk. He's one of the smartest people in the world. He's His companies make rockets that go to space missions and electric cars that pretty soon are going to be able to drive themselves too. And he thinks that it's so inevitable that we're going to lose jobs to AI, to automation, that governments should start paying us a steady income to make up for it. Which sounds kind of nice, doesn't it? I don't know if that'll happen, but, you know, he likes it. The World Economic Forum, which is this conference by some of the most important people in the world, has predicted that by 2020, 7 million jobs will be lost to automation. But, 2 million new jobs will be created because of it. So, in total, that's like 5 million jobs will lose. Now, these new jobs are going to look a bit like this. They're going to be roboticists who build robots, who maintain robots, engineers. Software engineers who build the code that power our devices, of which we have more and more every day. It's going to be data scientists who make sense out of all the data we generate on a daily basis. And it's going to be researchers, scientists, the people who drive this innovation in the first place. The World Economic Forum also predicts that what's going to be in demand, the skills that are going to be important, are soft skills, human skills, people skills. Skills like negotiation, skills like leadership, collaboration, sharing, things that humans can still do a little bit better than robots. How long that lasts, I can't tell you. Um, and what this means is, are these jobs going to be lost? Is a lawyer or an accountant not a good career choice anymore? Well, we don't know that. And that that question has so many variables that it's not really important. But what is certain is that we need to be prepared for this change. And the way we can be prepared is by building up our skills, learning new stuff, keep upgrading, not just in school, but also at work. I've worked both as a lawyer and as a journalist. And to be honest, I'm, I'd be kind of thrilled by bots that can do this, this job because it would be a huge help for me. Like if I could just put an AI to read like hundreds of pages of documents or to get them to write more news articles for me. That sounds great. But it means that maybe I'm less valuable to my boss this way. Maybe I don't get as much money. Maybe I need to learn how to do new stuff. Maybe, it's, maybe it has to be coding. Maybe it has to be, um, you know, judging from the state of these slides, maybe it has to be Photoshop. I don't know. So most governments right now are not prepared to deal with this. Um, there was a study by the, the U.S. government um, that found that the infrastructure in the U.S. is not enough to be able to teach students and workers new skills to counter automation. Because this kind of technological advancement does not stop. It's not going to wait. Singapore has been a, a lot better about this. Uh, for the past few years, Singapore has stressed the importance of its citizens learning new skills, upgrading, with initiatives like Skills Future, which gives every working Singaporean credit, money, to learn new skills. 
I've met journalists who use it to learn French. I've met people who use it to get computer classes. In 2016, 126,000 Singaporeans had taken classes with Skills Future, which shows that there's still room for improvement. But, you know, we will use it. Singapore also is introducing programming, coding, in schools a lot sooner now, as soon as old levels. And there are companies that are working with the government to introduce technology in preschool, teaching preschoolers computational thinking, which is the basis for learning how to program. Singapore aspires to be a smart nation, it, a nation connected by data, by technology. And to do that, it needs to get people familiar with technology. You need to get them to learn to work with technology, to, to learn to embrace it. Change of this magnitude is tough. It's never easy. It's so fundamental that it pulls the rug out from under us. But change can also be opportunity. It can be an opportunity to learn, to adapt, to create. It can be an opportunity to challenge our thinking and to embrace new ideas. That's when it's no longer just change, it's progress. Thank you very much.